Okay, um, so welcome everyone who's here, who's uh, people are just joining um, to another semester for TCS Plus. This is the first talk of the semester. Um, and it's really a huge pleasure to have Sib Schooley. He's currently a postdoc at Harvard and MIT. He'll be starting soon as a faculty in Cornell. And today is an especially um, good day because this is the 10 year anniversary of TCS Plus. Um, so yeah, I wanna encourage people to keep their cameras on um, and ask any questions. And yeah, other than that, I guess in two weeks, we'll have um, another talk by Jin Yoon Park. Um, but I think that is all for introductions and I'll, give the floor to you, Ziv, and take it away. All right, uh, thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to the TCS Plus Organizing Committee for uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be here on the 10th anniversary, and I guess a little bit ironic given that my talk will be not quite about TCS, uh, but as you can see from the title, is explicitly for a TCS audience, so hope um, I I hope this can maybe start some interesting discussion. I'm going to talk about uh, basically some scheduling problems um, from these two different perspectives, a bit of a TCS perspective, and then some new techniques that me and my collaborators have been developing to look at them from a different stochastic perspective based on queuing theory. And so speaking of those collaborators, um, the work I'm going to touch on today uh, is based prim primarily on work uh, with, with these folks. So I want to highlight, especially Isaac Grossoff, who's a final year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon and is graduating and on the job market this year. Um, also, lots of this work is with uh, our advisor or my former advisor and Isaac's advisor, Moore Harkle Balter, um, Alan Schellerwolf from the Business School at CMU, um, as well as one of my postdoc mentors right now, Michael Mitzenbacher. Okay, so, um, so basically today's talk is all about scheduling in queues. Um, and so what is scheduling all about? Well, scheduling is about reducing delay. So anytime you have contention for some shared resource, right, um, and you resolve that contention by waiting, that is uh, waiting for it to be available, that is by queuing, then you get delay due to that waiting. And so this happens all the time in your everyday life, like at your local supermarket. It also happens all the time in computer systems. So if you think about a network switch, uh, there might be lots of packet flows that want to go through the network switch, and the network switch can only serve one packet at a time. Okay, so how do we reduce delays? Well, there are a bunch of different ways to reduce delays. You could buy a faster network switch, or you could invent a new algorithm such that your data center doesn't actually have to do as much work. But um, in some ways, the easiest way, in, in some sense, to reduce delay is scheduling. That is just changing the order in which you do the tasks you already have. Um, and the good news about scheduling is that it's very cheap, right? You don't have to buy new hardware. You don't have to be super smart and invent a totally new algorithm that reduces the amount of work you have to do. Just by reordering things, you can really reduce delay. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that, uh, well, maybe actually scheduling isn't necessarily that easy after all. And we actually have a pretty limited understanding of many uh, sort of subtle aspects of scheduling. And so, and so what, what, why might we want to understand scheduling? Well, let's say you have an, you're have a system implementer and you have an idea for a scheduling policy for your queuing system, right? And so you want to evaluate if that's a good idea. You could actually implement it, run an experiment, or you could simulate it and run experiments that way. And for a handful of policies, this is okay. But if you want to know uh, whether there's something better out there, if you want to sort of explore the entire design space of scheduling policies, then just simulating uh, isn't good enough. So I really think that we need a rigorous theory of scheduling. And I think this audience will agree, uh, you know, as lovers of theory, that uh, rigorous theory can really help us uh, design better scheduling policies. And so, and so there, and so given that we need a rigorous theory of scheduling, there has been lots of theory done on scheduling, and uh, there's a lot of this. And I'm not going to do all of it justice, but I'm going to sort of broadly bucket it into two categories. So I'll, on one on one hand, I'll, uh, we have CS theory. Uh, which is basically approaches the problem of how should we schedule with worst case modeling. And, and as a result, and so, and I'll get into exactly what I mean by worst case modeling in a bit, but basically as a result of this, um, you end up with uh, general, a lot of the time you analyze relatively complex algorithms, not always, but a lot of the time in uh, from a CS theory perspective. 
Um, and this is um, and this is both good and bad, and I'll uh, get into that in a bit. Um, and then on the other hand, um, we have an, another community also studying scheduling, uh, which is queuing theory. And and these folks, of whom I am one, um, basically study scheduling from a perspective of stochastic modeling. So kind of by default, things are randomly generated. Um, and, and, and as a result, uh, queuing theorists often, or often end up studying relatively simple algorithms. Um, and, but they really understand exactly how those algorithms behave in these particular stochastic models. And so there are pluses and minuses to kind of both sides of, uh, both sides of this, uh, scheduling theory spectrum. So you could ask, well, you know, do my real systems really encounter the worst case possible input in real life? Um, that's, you know, a, a question you might have about CS theory, but you might also wonder, well, is the particular stochastic model I'm assuming in queuing theory, does that um, mirror real life? So which of these is closer to real life is sort of not always clear. Um, and then about the sort of simplicity of algorithms. On one hand, with CS theory, uh, uh, with CS theory, uh, there's sort of an ability to analyze very complex algorithms. But that there's also the question of, do we always need a very complex algorithm? Or are we only adding complexity to deal with worst case inputs that don't actually happen? And then on the other side, in queuing theory, uh, queuing theorists tend to tend to exactly analyze simple algorithms in these stochastic models. But this raises the question of, you know, what uh, should we really limit ourselves to these very simple algorithms? Do queuing does queuing theory have anything to say about anything more complicated? And so, you know, I think I think you know it's pretty safe to say that it's you know ideally best to learn from a bit of both of these. Um, and we'll see uh, some lessons that both of these teach us today. Um, but sort of from my perspective as a queuing theorist, as a queuing theorist, uh, one of these four problems kind of stands out a bit bigger than the others, which is this uh, kind of tendency for queuing theory to only focus on very simple algorithms. And sort of a big part of my research agenda and that of my collaborators has been kind of empowering queuing theory to tackle more complex scheduling algorithms and thus more complex scheduling problems um, so that we can kind of act, so that we sort of have queuing theory to match CS theory lessons for more and more scheduling problems. And so today I'm gonna focus on two different uh, kind of types of scheduling. I'm gonna focus on uh, scheduling problems that have multiple servers and scheduling problems that have noisy predictions. So this is a kind of example of algorithms with predictions. And I'm gonna sort of talk about both of these problems from both perspectives, a TCS perspective and a queuing perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about basically, I'm gonna focus especially on what new results in queuing theory driven by myself and my collaborators have sort of enabled us to sort of answer these questions from the queuing theory side for the first time. And the kind of the, the running theme is that, you know, the queuing theory results are kind of powered by sort of new general tools that we apply to these specific problems, but could be more generally applicable. And in particular, one of the tools I think there's potential for crossover into worst case analysis, TCS style. All right, so that with that kind of scene setting out of the way, um, let me get started by sort of talking about in a bit more detail what I what sorts of scheduling problems we're gonna talk about today and kind of what objectives we have. So what exactly is scheduling? So in the kind of simplest possible scheduling problem, um, at least from my perspective, we have a system with one server and a queue that can hold jobs that are waiting for service. And so this is a job. I'm gonna draw jobs as test tubes whose height is their size or service requirement. That's how long they need to be served for. And so we'll represent service as filling the test tube with water. And so we can talk about the remaining size of a job, that's the amount it has left, or the age, which is the amount the job has been served so far. And so we've got jobs arriving in an online fashion. And so now I can tell you what I mean by worst case versus stochastic. So in worst case modeling, these online arrivals are totally arbitrary. And we generally assume that uh, we as the scheduler don't know what the arrivals will be ahead of time. In the queuing version of the model, we're gonna assume a stochastic process for how these jobs arrive online. Um, and so that's the kind of big difference between the models. Um, so in particular for the results I'm gonna tell you about today, um, I'm not, you're not going to need to remember the specific details of this process, but just so you know kind of what the scope of the results are. I'm imagining uh, completely random arrival times of jobs, specifically a Poisson process, and that job sizes are drawn from some distribution, IID. 
And now this distribution can be anything, which is important because different types of computer systems have very different workload characteristics. So it's important to be flexible in this uh, job size distribution aspect. And this gives the system, a, and Lambda and S together give the system uh, uh, what's called its load, which you can think of as its utilization. It's how, in a very long period of time, the average fraction of time that the server will be busy. And so we're and so to have a stable system, we have to assume load is less than one. So that's the sort of kind of totally uh, sort of totally random arrival times uh, IID from an arbitrary distribution. That's the stochastic model we're going to be working with today. So, okay, so that's that. Those are so that's kind of the main difference between the worst case and stochastic models. All right, so let's keep going with our story. Uh, we might fi finish serving this job, and once its age reaches its size, it exits the system. It's done. And the total amount of time this job spent in the system, we're going to call its response time. And that's the kind of main metric we're going to care about today. How long do jobs spend in our system, right? We're trying to reduce delays. We're trying to reduce response times. OK, and now, now that the server is empty, we have this question, what jobs should we serve next? And that's what scheduling is. Scheduling is deciding at every moment in time which job to serve. And for today, we're going to focus on preemptive scheduling, meaning I can, at any moment in time, uh, switch which job is in service with no penalty of any sort and no restriction on when I can do this. Okay, and so um, so that's the kind of basic scheduling model with a single server, and so and um, and let's let's also assume that like as it as is drawn in the picture, I know the heights that is the sizes of all the test tubes, and so with that uh, with that information, let's ask you know how should I schedule jobs if I'm trying to minimize the average response time the average delay jobs experience. And so this is a kind of classic question, and it's known that in a worst case sense, the optimal policy is something called SRPT, shortest remaining processing time. You want to always serve whichever job has the least remaining size. The intuition is that you can kind of kick one job out of your system, get it over with as soon as possible. And by doing that, you reduce the sort of total amount of waiting that happens. Um, and so SRPT is a great policy if you have a single server system. But what if you have a multi-server system? So we're gonna, so for this first scheduling problem, multi-server scheduling, uh, we're gonna consider this basic model and change it in just one way, where we, instead of having one server, we have K. And so, um, and so now we might still want to use something like SRPT, right? It still seems like a good idea to get the short jobs out of the way as soon as possible. If I'm trying to minimize mean response time, um, but um, but instead of doing instead of always serving the single job of least remaining size, which I'll now refer to as SRPT one to disambiguate, now now we will be serving the up to k jobs of least remaining size. I'll call this SRPT k. And so and so we know that SRPT one is optimal in a single server system. How good is SRPT k? So. On the TCS side, this uh, this problem was studied by Leonardi and Raz back in two, 2007. And the answer they came to is, roughly speaking, it's not great, but it's also the best you can do. So specifically what they showed is that SRPTK compared to the offline optimal algorithm has this competitive ratio. Um, and basically the main thing to sort of know about this competitive ratio is that it's in some, is that it's the best you can do. They prove a matching lower bound, but it's also, there's no upper bound to this ratio. Um, so in particular, uh, this number, right, if we th think about a really long arrival sequence, this number of jobs is the sort of, if a uh, total number of jobs in a worst case arrival sequence. And so for a really big instance, this could be really big. And then, uh, and then the sort of other sort of bound for the competitive ratio has to do with the ratio of the sizes between the smallest and largest job. And uh, and because job sizes can be highly variable in practice, um, this quantity can be really big in practice. And so and so I think I, I sort of feel uh, that this, I sort of feel like there are some questions left open if you're if you're a practitioner and you're thinking, well, should I use SRPTK? Is that really the best I can do? Um, like, I, I think I think this leaves still some some of those questions open. It's not totally clear, even though it has the best possible competitive ratio. Um, 
we, you know, there might be other policies that achieve the same competitive ratio that still match that lower bound, but maybe uh, perform better in practice, right? Uh, or, or maybe on the other hand, maybe SRPTK really is good and that we shouldn't worry too much about this competitive ratio that we, you know, the really most of the time are significantly less than this worst case um, arrival sequence. And now, of course, I'm saying most of the time, you can't talk about most of the time in a worst case sense, but you can talk about worst most of the time in a queuing sense. So what does queuing have to say about this problem? And the answer is uh, nothing. It's a decades long open problem. And it's because, and, and this basically is a sort of running theme in queuing theory that multi-server systems are really hard to analyze. So to give you a sense of sort of uh, how queuing theorists think about this type of problem, let me sort of go back uh, to the 1960s and tell you about how queuing theorists think about the much simpler SRPT1. So this is a classic queuing theory result from, uh, from 1966. So the way this analysis works is we imagine a tagged job arriving to the system. So let's say this is me. So I'm a job, I arrive to the system that's in some random state. And random state, uh, I'm specifically thinking about the steady state distribution of the system, which is something well-defined given the stochastic arrival process. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out how long do, do, do I, the tagged job, spend in the system on average, given that I have some random size and I encounter some random system state. So that's the kind of main task we have to, uh, that, that uh, Schrage and Miller uh, did. And the way they did it is, is as follows. This, they sort of thought, well, the way SRPT works is it's prioritizing different jobs at different levels, right? It's, it's basically saying uh, jobs priority is its remaining size. So I'm going to formalize this as, as, as saying that let's a job's rank or priority be its remaining size, where lower rank is better. And for now, I'm just basically going to think about the ranks because the ranks determine who gets to go in front of who. So, and so the key quantity, if I arrive into the system and let's say my size is R, and so my starting rank is R, the key quantity that's going to determine mostly um, what my response time is turns out to be something called R work. So this is basically the amount of work in the system that has rank R or better. So it's the work relevant to a job of rank R. So I like to visualize this as I put on some rank R sunglasses and all the jobs that are uh, have rank R or less, I see those, um, but all the jobs that have rank more than R, I'm too cool for them, I don't care about them, and they're not gonna delay me. At least they're not gonna, uh, so I don't need to care about them in a single server system. And so this is basically the kind of, uh, you know, the first step of the SRPT1 analysis. And then a few pages of queuing theory later, you get an exact formula, not just that SRPT1 is optimal, but you exactly quantitatively compute what mean response time it actually achieves in terms of the stochastic uh, parameters of the system. So why can't we just do this for a K-server system, right? What goes wrong? And the answer is that there's a, there are a couple of ways that multi-server systems are much more difficult than single-server systems. So kind of the really nice thing about a single-server system is that that single server is a choke point. Every job has to go through that server. And so when the server is deciding who to serve based on based on these ranks, right, it respect you end up respecting the ordering of ranks absolutely. And so this is the kind of key property that means that if I walk into the system and I think about how much R work I observe, that's exact like that stuff is going to go ahead of me. Nothing else that's currently in the system will go ahead of me. And so that's why this strategy of observing the R work when I walk into the system is going to determine my response time. But this breaks down in a multi-server system, at least partly, right? No, there's no longer any single choke point, which means that roughly speaking, the rank ordering is not absolutely respected. Uh, and so the strategy of thinking about how much R work I see when I walk into the system no longer works. And so this tagged job approach that was used to analyze response time in single server systems, which is the classic strategy in queuing theory, is pretty much single server only. Um, uh, we have been able to do a little bit of stuff with multi-server uh, tagged job approach, um, which I'm happy to sort of answer questions about. But basically, uh, basically multi-server systems by and large need a new approach. So, how else are we going to analyze response time? So the the kind of first 
uh, a sort of first kind of thing to think about is, well, what are some ways to to sort of, what are some other ways we can get at response time that work in systems that have any number of servers? And one way to do this is a classic result from queuing theory, though it actually holds more generally than just in stochastic systems. It's a classic result known as Little's law. And so Little's law relates the mean response time of a system to the mean number of jobs. Specifically says that mean number of jobs is directly proportional to mean response time times the arrival rate. Um, and, um, and if you think back to sort of why SRP, the intuition for why SRPT was optimal, right? I said the intuition is you want to get something out of your system as quickly as possible. That's basically the intuition for why SRPT minimizes the mean number of jobs. But if you sort of look at the sort of, uh, if you sort of integrate number over time, you end up getting the sort of total waiting time, uh, which is, uh, which you can also show is, uh, approximately lambda ET for a long period of time. So that's Little's Law. Um, and the great thing about Little's Law is that it holds in great generality for any number of servers. So, so what this means is that if we want to analyze mean response time, we, you know, we can, it suffices to get at the mean number of jobs. That's still really hard. Um, but what we managed to do was we managed to come up with a new way to get the mean number, to get the number of jobs in the system in terms of our work that isn't the same as the tag job method. So this is a new queuing identity that we call wine. And, and wine uh, is going to hold in uh, like Little's law in basically any system, and in particular for any number of servers. So wine stands for work integral number equality, and is sort of a kind of the key tool that we use to analyze multi-server systems from a queuing theory perspective. Um, and so uh, kind of, I'm now going to sort of kind of review a bit about wine and how it and how it helps us. So I'm going to focus on the questions first. What exactly is our work? Um, I'm going to define it a little bit more precisely than let's put on some sunglasses and see what we see. I'm then going to explain sort of. I'm basically actually going to prove wine. I'm going to explain how we get the number of jobs from our work, and then we'll talk about um, how we actually analyze our work, right? Because wine reduces the problem. Of minimizing mean response time to that of minimize to, to that of analyzing our work. So we still need to analyze our work if we want to analyze uh, mean response time. Okay, so so let's go through these one by one. So first, what is our work? And uh, I should emphasize that I'm I'm going to sort of talk about our work in terms of in uh, in terms of ranks. Um, but as we'll see later in the talk, we can imagine sort of different ways of assigning ranks to jobs. And for now, I'm focusing on SRPT specifically. So a job's rank is its remaining size. So I've sort of hand wavily defined our work previously as the work relevant to a job of rank R. So to, to, to define this more precisely, let's define the R work of a single job of remaining size X. So um, if I'm a job of rank R and I'm looking at a job of size X, as long as R is less than X, I don't see the job. So it's R work is zero. And on the other hand, if R is at least X, then I see, then I see that job, and moreover, this job will always have rank less than R for the rest of its time in the system, right? Because under SRPT, a job's rank only gets better, only goes down, so its R work will be X. So that's the R work of a single job, and so the R work in the system is just the total R work of all jobs in the system. And so, how are we going to get the number of jobs in terms of our work. So, um, right, because our this seems really tricky because our work is this continuous quantity, whereas the number of jobs is a very discrete thing. Well, there's a hint in the name. Wine stands for work integral number equality. So I should be doing some sort of integral to our work to get the number of jobs. And uh and at least for the right sort of integral, by linearity, it would suffice to integrate a single job's R work and get one, right? Because the total system R work is just the sum of all the individual jobs' R work. And uh, this is actually kind of a cute puzzle to figure out sort of how to integrate a single job's R work to get one. Um, for time, I'll have to spoil it. It turns out if you put one over R on the X axis, then R work as a then R work then a single jobs R work as a function of one over R looks like this step function, and the step function has area one under the axis. 
And so what that means is if I integrate all R work with respect to one over R, this function will look like a staircase where each job is contributing one step and each step has area one, which means each job is contributing one. So I just found the number of jobs. So this is wine. It's the statement that the number of jobs is equal to this integral of uh, R work over R squared. The over R squared is for the change of variables between one over R and R. Um, and, and so, yeah, so that's wine. And here's a question. Where in the proof did we use the fact that we're thinking about SRPT? So this is a kind of, uh, oh, so I see there's a question in the chat. So this is the, uh, the question is, this is the number of relevant jobs, right? Not everyone in the queue. Um, okay, so important clarification. Yeah. Uh, so this so this formula uh, on the left-hand side is just the total number of jobs in the queue. On the right-hand side, we're integrating over all possible values of R, right? So we're no longer in a tagged job. We're no longer in this tagged job world where sort of I have some specific rank R and I'm thinking about what I see. Instead, I'm sort of, I'm sort of, uh, taking a step back, looking at the entire system and thinking about for all the different thresholds are, how much R work is in the system. And it turns out with this particular integral, um, by taking that inter uh, with this particular integral, I end up, yeah, uh, getting the total number of jobs, right? And this picture is more or less the proof. All right, so hope, uh, okay, cool. Glad that helped clarify. Um, so, uh, Right. So yeah, so there's this question, where did, you know, I, I talked about, we're going to analyze SRPTK. So where did we use the fact that we're talking about SRPT here? And there's actually only one place, which is when we were defining what a job's rank was and what, and therefore what our work was, right? We used specifically the fact that rank is remaining size. And that's how SRPT works. And so, um, but nothing else about this proof assumed anything about our system. So this holds under any scheduling policy. It holds under uh, any number of servers. It even holds with worst case arrivals. And so we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so, um, okay, so that's wine. So how does wine help us analyze, uh, how does wine help us analyze uh, SRPTK? So the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of strategy we used is we said, let's compare SRPTK which we don't understand, to something we already understand in queuing theory, SRPT1, right, analyzed in 1966. Um, and to sort of make this a fair fight, let's scale down our servers so that they're uh, k itty bitty servers of speed one over k versus a single server of speed one. And so we want to compare these mean response times. It's not clear how to do it directly. Wine helps us do this. We use wine to translate, uh, wine plus little's law to translate mean response time into mean R work. And then all we have to do is figure out how to compare these mean R work amounts. And so that's a lemma we call R work decomposition. And that gives us the sort of uh, com mean response time comparison. So, um, and one thing I should I should mention is that uh, comparing against SRPT1 uh, is a sort of valuable thing to do because SRPT1, right, with this one big server is at least as good as the optimal thing you can do with K little servers. The way to see this is to say that if you had k little servers, you could sort of, or you can simulate having k little servers by quickly switching your server between k different jobs. And so this is actually a comparison against something even better than the offline optimal. So, and so the and so the result is that we actually end up getting additive bounds for SRPTK um, in in uh, actually both queuing and you can also get a result in a worst case context. So I'll actually go over that worst case result first. So um, one of the key steps in Leonardi and Raza's proof uh, of, in their competitive analysis bounded the R work, bounded what we in our language would call the R work difference between SRPT1 and SRPTK. And so that difference was at most KR. And uh, it's, not it's not totally straightforward, but uh, using this fact, you can prove uh, a sort of additive bound for uh, in the TCS worst case world uh, for saying SRPTK, its average number of jobs is at most that in a sort of analogous SRPT1 system with the same arrivals plus 
a little bit extra to do with the ratio of the max and min job sizes. Um, what's new is that, so this is basically just a, a version, a, a sort of a restatement or a slightly tighter of an old result. What's new uh, is basically we can now do, say the same thing in queuing world. Um, and we actually get uh, a slightly tighter result because uh, we use a because we use a slightly tighter uh, lemma than this worst case one. And um, and then one of the important consequences of the queuing result is that we know how to analyze the number of jobs under SRPT one already. And we actually know that this is the dominant term um, most of the time for some definition of most of the time, um, roughly speaking, when you have finite variance job sizes. And so and so what this means is that uh, is that right? Because this n one is the dominant term, SRPTK is close to the best you can do. And so what this means is that you know now that we've done the queuing analysis using Wine, TCS and queuing agree on the question of how to schedule with multiple servers. Right? They both agree that SRPTK is pretty good, basically the best you can do. And actually, we can say something a little bit more general. Uh, it turns out that you can say in a bit more generality that both TCS and queuing theory end up agreeing that the right thing to do uh, is to adapt the optimal single server policy. So what do I mean by in general? So um, I've been focusing on the case where I know each job size exactly, right? But there are many scheduling problems where I, it, there are many settings where I don't know how long a job is going to take. Like a database query, in a, like a database query, I might know the query code, but not how long that code is going to take to execute. And so this question of scheduling with unknown sizes has been studied in both TCS and queuing worlds. Um, and in the TCS world, there's a policy called RMLF that is known to be uh, you know, pretty good with multiple servers. Um, and in queuing world, there's a policy called Gittins, which is known to be the optimal policy in a single server system. And we were using Wine able to prove that it was also, uh, in fact, obeyed the exact same bound as SRPTK in a multi-server system. And there's a kind of deep connection between uh, wine and Gittins, uh, which is why the wine bottle is green. Um, but that's for another talk. OK, so, um, so that concludes what I wanted to say about multi-server uh, multi scheduling. Um, I guess any questions before I move on to scheduling with noisy predictions? Okay, so let's let's talk about um, scheduling with noisy predictions. So I just talked about scheduling with known sizes, and I alluded to some to res results with unknown sizes. Noisy predictions are somewhere in between, right? Noisy predictions are a setting where when a job comes in, right, I'm told some estimate for its size, but that estimate might not be right. So the picture in my head is a sort of test tube with a fuzzy uh, fuzzy top, where I don't know exactly where the top of the test tube is. I know it's somewhere near Z where Z is this estimated size. And so the model we're going to assume it, so the model we're going to work with today is what we'll call beta alpha bounded noise. So the mnemonic is beta is for below, alpha is for above. And it says that if a job's true size is S, its estimated size is within uh, this beta alpha multiplicative window of that true size S. Um, and, uh, and so in the worst case, in, in worst case arrivals, this is basically all we're assuming. For the queuing, for the queuing model, what we're going to assume is uh, we're going to assume something a little bit stronger, which is we're going to assume both that we have we have this boundedness, and that the way that these true estimated size pairs are generated is from some joint distribution. We're not going to assume anything about what this distribution is, just like how we didn't assume what anything about what the job size distribution was before. Now we're not assuming anything about either S or Z or their correlation, except for this boundedness, which is an important part. And our goal, um, and so our goal is we're going to still try and minimize mean response time. Um, but we're going to try and design a policy that gets good mean response time, sort of no matter what these parameters are. Right. So just as SRPT, it minimizes mean response time when you have known sizes, no matter what the distribution is. And we just saw, basically, no matter how many servers you have, it's a good idea. We're going to try and do the same thing now, do the same thing now with noisily predicted sizes, where no matter what alpha and beta are, no matter exactly how S and Z are correlated in the queuing case, 
we'd like to get good mean response time. And so how well can we handle this noise? So, um, uh, and so this question has actually just recently been studied in the TCS world. Uh, so that in, uh, so in, so, and they use the term distortion to talk about the size of this multiplicative window, alpha over beta. And so, and so in TCS world, the kind of results, uh, the, the new results are due to uh, uh, Yossi Azar, Stefano Leonardi, and Noam Tuitu. And what they show is that basically you can handle noise pretty well, but you need a sophisticated policy to do it. And so they introduced this policy called zigzag that managed to get a sort of a small competitive ratio relative to SRPT, which is sort of cheating because SRPT knows, uh, you know, knows the true sizes. So they get this gamma log gamma ratio where gamma is the distortion and a nearly matching lower bound. Um, and one thing about this lower bound is that it actually doesn't approach one. So as uh, as gamma sorry, as as alpha and beta approach one, this lower bound uh, approaches, I believe, two. Um, and so even just a little bit of noise can really mess you up in the worst case. And also this this policy zigzag that they come up with is a is you know it's not it's not intractable, but it's not simple. Uh, you know they kind of they show in their in their work why various simple policies won't work. Um, and so one one sort of question one question that occurs is you know do we really need such a complicated policy to deal with noise in practice? And so kind of the queuing uh, the sort of queuing question that occurs is can we do better with a simple policy if we make a stochastic assumption? And so what you know what sort of policies am I talking about when I say simple policies? So I've alluded to this idea of scheduling uh, with ranks where I always serve the job of least rank, right? So SRPT is an example of this. I'm now going to sort of generalize and formalize this by with the idea of rank functions. So this is going to map a job's age, A, to a some priority level. Rank lower is better. And a job's rank I'll also let depend on its, so on its uh, size or estimated size, um, or possibly both. Um, though we're going to have to be careful to... Uh, we're, uh, depending on what we know, we may or may not be able to actually use the size S. So for example, SRPT has rank function S minus A, because SRPT knows the size. And so a simple thing you might do is, well, okay, if I don't know the size, but I know the estimate Z, uh, what if I just do Z minus A instead of S minus A? And so this is a kind of naive uh, translation of SRPT to the noisy setting. All right. And so and so I'll talk in a, in a second about, you know, whether this is a good idea, but the sort of point I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, we've now sort of narrowed down this uh, design space of relatively simple policies, but still quite flexible with these rank functions. And so by varying the rank function, we can vary the decisions our scheduling policy makes. And so, and so now we've kind of reduced our question to what's the right rank function, or rather, is there any rank function that works? And so let's start with this naive naive idea where I just do Z minus A instead of S minus A. And so is this going to be a good policy? Is this going to give me low mean response time? Or are there problems? And so it turns out that uh, you know folks studied this in simulations and found that it was sometimes good and sometimes bad. And roughly speaking, it was bad when you had lots of variance in job sizes. And the thing that goes wrong is here. Once a job's rank goes negative, that basically means it's going to have better rank than any new job coming in. Why is that bad? Well, if a job's if a job size was underestimated, if a really big job, you know, size a thousand, uh, was estimated as being size nine hundred instead, then for the last one hundred seconds of its of its service, it'll be non preemptible. But if a job of size of a job of estimated size one comes in, you know, uh, you'd you'd probably want to do that job of estimated size one ahead of this job of uh, that you know has uh, that ends up actually having quite a lot left. And so this idea of making jobs non-preemptible is really bad news for highly highly variable job size distribution. Uh, this is like super true in the worst case, but it's even true in the stochastic case. Even in the stochastic case, you can get unbounded. Uh, or infinite competitive ratio. Okay, so how should we fix this problem? Well, the problem was going negative. So what if we don't do that? Uh, so this gives a policy called checkmark. Uh, and this is better 
And for small enough alpha and beta, this is actually good. Um, but what happens for kind of large-ish alpha and beta, like if beta is, or sorry, I should say alpha and beta far from one, specifically if beta is less than half, um, what that means is that the psi, you know, this is a, you could have jobs that are really underestimated. And in particular, if beta is less than one half, what can happen is that if a job, you know, okay, well, I've been serving this job, I've realized it's not as short as I thought, so I'm going to punish it by putting it, making its rank go up. But then if the rank goes above the initial rank of Z, that job has a sort of new worst rank. And what can happen is a bunch of other jobs can accumulate at ranks uh, close to Z, like between Z and Z plus a little bit. And so when and so when this uh, and so when this underestimated job is kind of now probably close to done, right? Because I've been running it for more than twice its estimate. It's all of a sudden getting a new worst rank, and it's likely to be preempted. And so this can cause a problem. And so we we've identified two problems uh, with our with that a rank function can have. And so we could ask, what if we do neither of those? You know, what if we bounce off of zero, but then don't go above uh, this dotted line at Z? Um, and so uh, we called this policy, at least for the talk, we called it radical because it kind of looks like a square root sign. Um, and, it, and, it, and it turns out this solves both problems and has good mean response time. So we were able to show that in a queuing model um, that is in the, with stochastic arrivals and these sto stochastically generated estimate size pairs, uh, we have a sort of uh, a nice a sort of nice bounded competitive ratio uh, relative to SRPT, where here SRPT is also kind of uh, you know being measured in this stochastic model. And so this the the sort of approximation ratio specifically is proportional to this distortion gamma, and the proportionality constant depends on exactly what alpha and beta are. So it depends on whether you're tending to overestimate or tending to underestimate. Um, but the key things to know is, is that it's always less than three and a half, and it converges to one as alpha and beta converge to one. So this is actually like slightly better performance. This is uh, basically you know slightly better performance, especially for really low noise, than we could even hope for in the worst case. So um, so that's the result. Um, I'll say just a few words because uh, I don't want to take uh, I don't want to go too too long over time. Uh, so I'll say just a few words about how we actually do this analysis, right? So how are we going to compare radical to SRPT? So the kind of key idea we had was to, rather than comparing them directly, we went through a, th a third rank function, which we called scale. And so this scale rank function is, a, is, a, is kind of an odd one, right? So here, uh, radical, this rank function only uses the estimate Z. SRPT only uses the true size S. Scale uses both. So you can't actually implement scale without knowing sizes, but you also wouldn't actually use scale if you knew the si if, uh, if you didn't know the size. So scale is not something you would actually use. It's more of an analysis tool. And it turns out scale and radical are similar enough and scale and SRPT are similar enough that we can kind of uh, do this two-step analysis. And so how do we do these two steps? So, uh, so, the first, so this first step, radical and scale, we do this analysis using another queuing theory tool called SOAP, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the second step, we use wine again. So the same kind of uh, R work integral that we used before. So I'll talk very briefly about SOAP, uh, about, about SOAP and how we use it. So SOAP, um, it stands for Schedule Ordered by Age-Based Priority. Uh, this is a backronym that basically is a synonym for rank function. And so the idea of SOAP is uh, it takes this is a sort of new result in queuing theory. Uh, it's a big part of my thesis that basically says, given any stochastic arrival process and any rank function, um, the simple one, uh, uh, no matter what the, that rank function is, we can write down some formula in terms of that rank function for the response time distribution, at least in a single server system. So unlike wine, SOAP is very inherently stochastic. It actually uses that tagged job method that we talked about uh, that's from 1966, but uses a sort of souped up version of that with a bunch of uh, extra bells and whistles to make it work. And so I definitely don't have time to even like describe even just the formulas we get using SOAP, but the high level thing I'll mention is that, you know, basically the, uh, these rank functions uh, for radical and scale, because the rank functions are kind of similar, 
you end up with similar mean response time formulas. And uh, and the formulas are messy, but we can, you know, they're similar enough that we can bound their difference. And the kind of key way in which these rank functions are similar is that it has to do with that worst rank a job has, right? Remember with check mark, the problem was the job goes above its initial rank. And so it has a new worst rank way into the future. Well, both scale and radical sort of stay under this dotted line where a job's initial rank is its estimate. And then it only gets, it never goes above that again. And that's the kind of key way in which these rank functions are similar. All right. And then, so that's kind of how we use SOAP to compare radical and scale. Um, to compare scale and SRPT, I mentioned we use wine. So let me sort of sketch very briefly how we do that. So the kind of key lemma um, is sort of a sandwich, um, is, a, uh, is a sandwich that basically says the R work under scale um, turns out to be more than the average R work under SRPT, but less than the average R work under SRPT scaled, but where, where ex instead of R work, I'm actually looking at gamma R work, where gamma is this distortion factor. And, and I think, uh, for, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'll probably, I have the key steps of the proof, but I think I'll skip these for now. Uh, but I'm happy to sort of, uh, talk about them offline. Um, and the sort of result is that, well, if I, if I sort of plug this R work sandwich into wine, um, sort of the, here I, I get, you know, what I know already, which is that the mean number in SRPT is at most that under scale, right? Because SRPT minimizes the mean number. But then I get, uh, but then a sort of change of variables with this gamma ends up, the gamma ends up sort of plopping out, out here. And so I get that scale compared to SRPT is just off by a factor of gamma. And so, it is, and so basically, uh, wine helps us do this comparison because scale and SRPT are doing more or less the same thing, right? Just scale a bit more noisily. And so there are work amounts that end up being close enough. And so that's kind of, uh, so that's the sort of story I wanted to tell about noisy predictions. And here we see that uh, TCS and queuing theory kind of teach us or sort of have opposite recommendations. They're a little bit at odds, right? TCS tells the sort of worst case approach tells us we need to be really careful. The noise could be super bad and adversarial, and that could really mess us up. And so we need a sort of complicated policy to, to deal with that. Whereas the, in queuing, uh, we basically see that a very simple rank-based policy sort of just bounce off the right lines in the right way ends up sufficing uh, for uh, very good performance, including uh, approaching the sort of best possible performance as the noise approaches zero. OK, and so uh, that basically con concludes my talk. I'll just say, uh, sort of summarize kind of what we talked about today. So today, we talked about two different scheduling problems from TCS and queuing perspectives. The first scheduling problem with uh, how to schedule with multiple servers, we saw that both perspectives end up teaching us the same lesson, which is that at a high level, if we treat the multi-server scheduling problem like a single server scheduling problem, we're going to be just fine. And uh, whereas with uh, we also talked about the problem of scheduling with noisy predictions, and we saw that we kind of have opposite recommendations. And so how you should schedule in practice with noisy predictions depends a lot on what that noise looks like and whether the noise is closer to stochastic or closer to adversarial. And so for example, uh, and so for example, if you're scheduling where users where users with various incentives are giving the predictions, you you probably have to treat those more in the TCS style. Whereas if it's coming from sort of uh, some you know some more exogenous process, maybe the queuing style works. Okay, and the queuing results were powered by these two new tools, Wine and Soap. Wine uh, Wine actually holds also in a worst case sense, so there's some potential crossover use uh, in TCS, uh, of which I sort of just gave one example today, uh, kind of rederiving a known result. And then for SOAP, um, I'm kind of excited about SOAP mostly because the idea of modeling scheduling policies with rank functions is very flexible. And it allows you to sort of model in detail uh, certain kind of aspects of computer systems uh, which haven't been analyzed at all before from a queuing perspective. Um, and so I'm kind of, uh, so I sort of see both wine and soap as playing a big role in kind of powering up queuing theory to be able to kind of teach us some interesting scheduling lessons. All right, and that concludes my talk. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions.
the result that he showed for noisy prediction from the queuing perspective is it tight because you have the linear upper bound uh so the, the question was is the result for uh is this result can you say the question is is this result tight um yeah so So the short uh, the short version is no, um, or at least not at least we don't know. Um, so, so there's a couple of things we might mean you, that you can mean by is this result tight. One thing you can mean is is this result tight for radical itself. There we don't know the answer. Um, like we know we know the obviously we know the C alpha beta converging to one as alpha and beta converge to one. That's tight. That's the best you can do. Whether you can have a global bound better than 3.5, we're not sure. Uh, uh, at least for ra whether radical satisfies a global bound better than 3.5, we're not sure. One thing we do know, though, is that there are other policies that have a better global bound than 3.5. Um, so, for example, uh, if you do an even the even simpler rank function, where a job's rank just stays at Z the whole time, it turns out that this policy is really bad in the worst case, uh, even with no noise. But in, in queuing, it has a approximation ratio of 1.5 with no noise. So that's based, so that would be sort of like a job's rank starts at S and just stays at S. That has an approximation ratio of 1.5 in queuing world. And what we showed is that that analogous policy in estimate world has an approximation ratio of 1.5 gamma. And so basically that policy is sort of uh, extra robust to noise. And uh, and specifically what we showed is that it's always a factor of gamma worse than it would be at most uh, than the noiseless version. Um, and so we know that there are policies that get a better global bound than 3.5. Um, and so actually our kind of the, my practical recommendation to like someone implementing a system would be just use that flat flat at z rank function because it's even simpler and it's just as good if not a little better now whether you can do better than 1.5 that's still open okay so i'll take us off the recording and kind of we can ask questions and just hang out